I did. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Link Senior webinar. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin today. We are going to provide one free NCAP and NCCDP CEU credit to participants who are joining us live. To be eligible for those CEU credits today, you need to remain in the webinar room for the full hour. The Zoom meeting room is going to track how long you are in the room and will send that as a digital report to me following the call. We are not able to provide CEUs to those who join only by phone. At the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box. I will also be sending that survey link by email this afternoon. And be sure to check your email spam folder in case it lands there. If you want CEU credit, you must fill out that survey no later than midnight this Thursday, April 30th to be eligible for the CEU credit. If you are not looking for CEU credit, we still want your feedback. So please go ahead and fill out that short survey today as well. CEU certificates will be issued by email on Friday, May 1st. And again, please just check your spam folder in case it lands there. And now I'm going to hand it over to Charles DeVilmorn, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Charles. Thanks, Megan. Um, hi, everyone. Good, uh, good afternoon for some of you. Still good morning. Mm -hmm. I am um, particularly excited for today's presentation about meaning in the time of COVID-19. Uh, we welcome back, actually, two fantastic presenters we've had. Uh, Don Worsley, the president of NCAP, who's uh, presented with us in the past, and she's been helping us uh, with our additional webinar series related to COVID-19 and how we help you, activity and life enrichment professionals, uh, in these uh, difficult times. And we also welcome back Anne Ennett, and she's the uh, CEO of Memory Care Support, some of you might remember she was on with us and was it in february i think um we, i'm sorry i think it yeah. might have been early march yeah early mm -hmm. march yeah so um before we do anything um there's something that we've not well uh, that i'd like to do with everyone which is to just take a very short moment of silence and I know it's kind of unusual uh, to do that on a webinar, but I know that um, uh, some of us have experienced losses or know someone that have experienced losses recently, whether it's COVID-19 or else. And I just wanted us all together to just take just a few seconds of silence to acknowledge uh, these losses and, and think a little bit about it. Thank you. And hopefully we can take that as a gift, um, you know, to take care of ourselves and, um, and obviously to also take care of the ones under our care. So with that, um, I again welcome both Don and Anne today. Uh, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background on these webinar series. Uh, we started them more than two years ago, and they all focused on helping you professionals in the field in advancing 
quality of life of residents through uh, resident engagement. Um, we've been very uh, lucky and, and pleased to have wonderful speakers join us. And as always, we are extremely interested in your feedback. Um, so if you think of anyone that we should invite, uh, feel free to, to let us know. To give you a little bit of background, Link Senior is, uh, I started the company actually more than 10 years ago. And what we do is we provide a resident engagement platform for uh, senior living, senior care. So we help anything from assisted living, uh, memory care and nursing homes in making sure that every resident is engaged and uh, lives a life full of purpose. Um, we had research that was published back in September where we really helped quantify the impact of resident engagement. And we very, um, just a few days ago, we announced an initiative called Activity Strong. And I invite you to stay until the end of this webinar where we have actually special announcement um, and, and a special invitation. So with that, um, let's get on to the program. So what we've done in this particular series focused on COVID-19 is with the help of uh, Dawn is really understand, um, obviously it's an ever going, changing everyday uh, situation. So Dawn helps us understand what are the most recent CDC and CMS guidance. So here we're going to be talking about the changes in, uh, on April 25th, but also share a little bit of her perspective as she, as she heads NCAP. So that's going to take us about 10, 15 minutes. And then Anne will go uh, for the main segment of today's presentation, which is really focusing on meaning and purpose in the time of COVID-19. So Dawn, I'm going to let you present. And as always, if you want, I can uh, hit the slides for you and advance the button. That would be great if you could do that, Charles. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for allowing me to uh, give you the most recent information that I have. So on April 25th, the uh, CMS guidance released from the CDC a PPE burn calculator. So it's a spreadsheet. The link is there. And what it does is uh, to use the calculator, you enter the number of full boxes of each type of PPE you have in stock. And then it calculates the average consumption rate, also referred to as the burn rate, uh, using the number of positive or suspected cases you have or anyone that's on droplet precautions. Uh, this information then is used to estimate how long the remaining supply of PPE will last based on your average consumption rate. So it can be used by anyone, an assisted living, a nursing home, an independent living. So the reason why I say this, because why is this important if your community is using it? Why is it important that activity directors know this? Well, this information is a, is a very effective communication tool to communicate, mm -hmm. ensure our, to, to ensure to our staff that we are protected, that we have enough PPE. Um, I use this information uh, that is shared with me through my administrative staff when communicating weekly updates to my residents. I also use this to communicate to families to provide reassurance that we're on top of things. So if we advance to the next slide, we'll talk about some of the other guidance that was released on the 25th. And there's a lot of social media questions about what our nursing homes, assisted livings, independent livings expect it to do now that there's talk about states opening up. Well, even as states are beginning to lift and their stay at home orders, nursing homes must continue to maintain the current restrictions on visitors. CMS released that guidance on March the 13th and that has not changed. The guidance indicates that individuals other than essential care staff and visitors for end of life situations should no longer enter nursing homes until further notice. Even though states may be lifting their individual stay at home orders, nursing homes must follow the directives of CMS until the new guidance is received. Now, assisted living communities and independent communities must follow their state guidance. If there's no state guidance, it's recommended by the American Healthcare Association and the National uh, Adult uh, Living uh, uh, Adult Living um, Association to follow the same CMS guidance. 
uh, and con continue to restrict the number of people entering the facility. Now, the, of course, CMS has also recently emphasized the importance of testing for COVID-19 in nursing homes. So in addition, a growing number of states are requiring testing for all residents and staff. Now, here's the thing, when you do the testing, uh, you need to make sure that you have a plan as to what we're gonna do when you find out that you do have uh, cases of residents and or staff that are asymptomatic. Because once you have someone that does test positive, what's the plan to isolate them, to put them in a, a holding area for observation? So, but there is a lot of widespread testing. I've been talking to activity directors uh, and administrators uh, throughout the East Coast, and that has been a big initiative. So where they started out with maybe having two or three, five cases, deciding that they were going to do a surveillance testing, testing everyone, now they have 18 to 20 cases. Uh, remember the issue, the biggest issue is, is you, you really do wanna know who is positive because a lot of uh, asymptomatic residents were walking around or, or wheeling or, or interacting with uh, and we wanna make sure that we have a plan in place. Now, as far as documentation, the law firm Hunch Blackwell, if you are a member of the American Healthcare Association, they actually have some legal documents, um, some guidance on documentation uh, and, and resources for members to use. So let's talk about activity documentation. We did a lot of this the last time we met, so I just want to uh, quickly just recap. Uh, care plans, you want to have an integrated approach uh, with the focus to decrease anxiety secondary to isolation imposed by COVID. I have a binder as an activity director with everything COVID related. I have updates from CMS, CDC, Maryland Health Department. Uh, I have my NCAP guidance. Uh, I also have any copies of education that I attended to prove my competency through all of this. So all of these great webinars that Link Senior has been doing or your professional associations, uh, like the National Association of Activity Professionals or American Healthcare Association or CMS, keep all of that together. Because again, I think that uh, this is a great way to, to just reiterate how hard we've been working to stay on top of all of this daily information. I also keep copies of all my daily activity calendars, blank orientation calendars, anything that changed in the month of May, March, April, we'll talk about May in a minute. I also keep a copy of all my invoices and receipts of things that I have purchased for activities for engagement. Um, Congress is getting ready to pass the healthcare provider relief package, and it's to cover the extraordinary cost of operating a community under COVID-19. So there are many companies that are having department managers, specifically activities, indicate on the invoices that this was specific to COVID, and this is why you had an increase. Uh, for me, I'll give you an example. I have 200 residents. My budget's a little over $2,200 a month. But in the month of March and April, I've exceeded $7,000. I track the number of residents who are participating in, in independent, self-directed, or Zoom-based activities. And before COVID-19, you know, I might have 40 residents to an activity, which is great. Well, now I have 90 residents participating, so of course you have to have the supplies to support that. If we can go on to the next slide, there are some best practices that were put out by the American Healthcare Association, uh, technology, online museums, modern art, um, contacting your local community colleges and universities to see if there's any online classes that might be appropriate for your residents. Uh, of course, reading magazines, tablets, e-readers, uh, depending on the appropriateness of your residence. I just read that uh, CMP grants, civil money penalty grants, are now open up to states with the specific technology needs related to COVID. So you can write a grant if you need tablets to help with your resident engagement. Arts and crafts are always a positive um, area. There is a project Linus. So if you go on to the American Healthcare Association site, it talks all about this project and um, how blankets and pillows are made uh, for children in need. 
exercise, movement. This, we want to keep the residents active. Even if you don't go into the residence room, we can do that through um, hallway dancing. Uh, we've seen a lot of that on social media. Um, and then again, what do activities do best? They are creative. It has been all inspiring to watch uh, social media explode with the great way that activity professionals take a situation and turn it into positive with their goal is to bring smiles on the staff and the residents. And let's final, uh, go to this next slide. And I want to talk about uh, the restrictions. Uh, you know, this country is very large, which leads to variances from what one facility may experience in one state and what another state can do. And that's even with my own company. So keep in mind that there's no right or wrong way. Uh, I think all companies are um, first and foremost wanting to keep everyone safe. We want to make sure that our residents are engaged. So some of the best practices that are out there that I have been aware of is, you know, give it, activity professionals getting the direction to limit exposure to residents in general. Non-COVID residents, I make weekly engagement boxes, and I think we've talked about them before, uh, where I put all of the supplies that we're going to do for our live broadcasted activities, self-directed activities, daily chronicles, newsletters, religious materials, uh, anything that relates to them, and we hit the floors once a week to give everyone those types of supplies. Um, on our, what we have labeled our COVID floors with isolating positive cases or observation rooms. Now, what I have seen, uh, even though this is a facility by facility judgment, um, as far as how do we go in, how do we engage with those residents, do we work directly with our nursing staff, uh, that is certainly a possibility that we can do. Again, you have to work with your administrator, but please keep in mind that there is no guidance to the reduction or the ex uh, expectation of um, not to adhere to FTAG 679, which is our activity programming tag. Uh, I, what I do is make sure that my staff are assigned to specific units, and we try to keep every staff member on the unit. The same thing that nursing does, with staffing levels, it's the same thing that we want to try to do with activities. Sometimes that's not always possible, but we want to try to limit the exposure. Resident Council, uh, that, that we talked about last time, it's listed on the NCAP website. I still get emails and requests, but feel free to go onto that site, go to our COVID response, and you can print off those documents to do the Resident Council. Um, what I learned, uh, is that residents will give me great feedback, what they like, what they don't like, what they would like to see. So this way, as we move into the month of May, uh, then I can modify what's in the boxes. I can modify some of the activities. We ask them for some suggestions for National Nursing Home Week. So based on this guidance from CMS that we just talked about a few minutes ago, um, I don't foresee as a country uh, us going back to group programs in the month of May. So when you're looking at May calendars, I'm still doing a daily activity calendar. I plan it out for a week in advance. Uh, so that way uh, we can communicate and it also helps me with some of the planning. National Nursing Home Week, which is now called National Skilled Care Week. Uh, you know, the, the theme for this is sharing our wisdom. Some of the things that I have seen is uh, sharing, getting the residents' perspective, their pearls of wisdom. You know, what I did is I just passed out this, or being passed out this week, images of pearls on cardstock. And as we pass them out to the residents, we ask them for their pearls of wisdom that they've learned throughout their life that they want to, to give back to the next generation. Next week, we'll collect those pearls and we're going to display them on strands in the windows. Uh, that we can use uh, for staff also. Um, family perspective, we're getting the families to contribute their, the wisdom that they gained from their loved ones, from their mother or their father, uh, their grandmother, their aunt, and we're putting that into a PowerPoint that we'll display for the residents. And then we're also asking the family members uh, just to write a little comment, uh, a little thank you to any staff member that's went above and beyond, and we'll be doing a slideshow for that. 
Next slide, and this is the last one, and I'll turn it over. Um, the presentation is, I want to let you know that NCAP is doing a weekly networking opportunity. This is not a continuing education. Uh, this is just a place for activity professionals to come, talk about their week, ask about any questions, network. This week, we have a special guest, Gabriel Reed from New York City. Gabby's toured on Broadway with the color purple, and she's graced the stage uh, in both um, in movies and musicals, and she'll be with us, and that's the information on how to connect from there. So without further ado, let me turn this over. Thank you, Don. You covered Thank you. quite a lot in the, just a few minutes. <laughs> Um, just, just as an FYI, we've had a number of questions about residence council um, during this time of isolation, especially when one of our homes was a COVID-19. I just want everybody to know that NCAP has a wonderful website, which has a lot of resources to help you understand how to adapt your policies and procedures, including uh, residence council uh, ones. So with that, I wanted to get a, go ahead and introduce Anne. Um, but let me let me share something with you, which is that at Link Senior, we were wondering, you know, how do we quote unquote define resident engagement in our work? And obviously, we love the idea of collaborating with the older adult so that they can live with purpose. And the reason I'm explaining that is when we reach out to Anne as Anne is uh, one of the experts when it comes to dementia and creating meaningful experiences for the older adult. When we reach out to Anne and asked her, you know, would you be interested in doing a presentation today? Her answer besides a yes was, you know, we could talk about meaning in uh, the context of COVID-19. And obviously there's a lot of overlaps between the context of meaning the concept of, sorry, of meaning and purpose. And so I find it extraordinary to be able to have someone such as Anne present to us something that obviously is always important, right? Um, the people living uh, with dementia always need uh, support and, and uh, to find meaning, but obviously hearing from an expert such as Anne uh, to understand what are the impact of that kind of work today uh, in this crisis of COVID-19 is a fantastic opportunity. So thank you, Anne, for being here. Thank you, Anne, for your presentation. And again, if anyone has questions for uh, the uh, panelists, please feel free to put them in the chat or Q&A. Anne, it's all yours. And I'm going to send you the controls right now. Let me know if you don't get them. OK, thank you. Thank you all. Um, Don had a lot of great information and thanks for this opportunity. And also thank you, Charles, for that moment of silence. I think all of us are struck with how hard everyone is working, how committed everyone is working, and um, how the extra level that people are going to to keep their residents safe during all of this. So a lot of wonderful, wonderful things going on here. So let me move my slides. And I apologize here. There's an arrow for me to do that. We practice so well, why isn't it working? And if you press um, the down arrow on your keyboard, that might work. Uh, yeah, it was doing very well. It's doesn't want to respond. So can I ask you to take it back and uh, go to the next slide? Happy to. It Thank says you. I'm controlling Charles' screen, but it didn't seem to go there. Do All right. So try next time, Anne, and they might work next time. All right. Um, Yes, I, I am struck with the, I, mean, I think like Don said, turning all of this into something positive. And what I'm hearing from caregivers, from families, 
uh, from activity directors, nurses, is that they've had to really recenter and focus on what's the most essential. Um, absolutely the most essential is going to be the safety. And as a nurse practitioner, it's a little frustrating how um, spotty it is, policies, procedures, how one county, one state, uh, one professional organization, they all have slightly different recommendations and guidelines. Uh, the testing is a big quagmire for all of us uh, that it hasn't been available that as a nurse, I can tell you that's how any other public health pandemic would have been handled is we test and then we know who we can put in a special area together and who is negative and who's healthy to work and so many ramifications of that. So we're all struggling and working around that. But uh, we've all, I think, had the opportunity to appreciate our teams during this, the strengths and the resourcefulness and the creativity that Don spoke about. My goodness, uh, where does this come from? It's bubbling up, it's rising up and uh, offering so many positive things to us. It's also, hopefully, we're gonna be refining some of our systems. So in the future, we're gonna be better prepared and um, we will, be able to more quickly be more nimble and respond better. So, so those are positive things that I'm hoping will come. Next slide. So today we want to discuss about how we can still bring meaning and having meaningful engagements. And as Charles mentioned, my background, um, I've specialized in dementia care for 20 years and I can remember back in the days when it was acceptable to tie people in beds and tie people in chairs. So thank goodness that there were a lot of good people who said there has to be a better way, a more meaningful way to offer quality of life to people living with dementia. But I think um, it's still a challenge for us. Um, so in this time of stress and when our staff is stressed, when we're stressed, when we're trying to fulfill many roles because there might be holes in the team. Certain people are out ill. Uh, you might be short staffed. We're, we're picking up many, many pieces while we try and uh, maintain good quality and, and meaning for our residents. Um, it, the, the residents, it translates to stress for the residents also. Uh, I know when I was um, in a assisted living memory care a couple of weeks ago, the uh, resident was saying, it's so different. And she pointed and in comes the caregiver wearing a mask. Um, really tough to have that nonverbal, meaningful communication when most of your face is covered. So residents are picking up that things are different. And again, I'm, I'm mainly referring to your residents that are living with dementia. They know that things are different. Uh, they understand great parts of it, but there's some of it that might be disorienting to them and uh, causing anxiety. So next slide. Um, so we want each person, each of your residents to feel like, and for, for lack of a better way to say it, to, to feel like they have been seen. To, to, I think we all can uh, think very quickly to an instance where someone comes into you and says, oh, it's great to see you, or oh, how are you? But if you start to tell them how you are or how your day is, you can tell that they kind of immediately tune you out. They, they didn't really, they weren't really interested in that. They, they have another task to go on to. And that's, that's what I'm hearing uh, from our residents is what's different, why is this happening? And um, that they, they say, everyone's so busy, Every, everyone's so busy, they don't have time for me. And so if nothing else, when we talk about meaning, I'm asking us kind of like that moment of silence, all of us to maybe take a breath, step back a, a moment, and be sure that when you do enter into the space of a resident, that you, you are engaged, that you are communicating, 
that you are focused on that moment, maybe for that task that you're hoping to also be able to complete while you're in there, but you're also first connecting and there's communication going on. Next slide. Um, people living with dementia are often already isolated and confined. I don't know uh, where all of you are working. It can vary a lot from nursing home and assisted living and, and one place or another, but often you will see that a special area has been created for the residents who are living with dementia. And that's a whole other topic that, that I love to talk about because I personally don't feel that that's effective because we know that the, the, one of the primary reasons that people come in for care is because they have cognitive changes. So for us to say that, oh, the people who live on this side of the door are okay, and those people who live behind the door have dementia, often it's a whole spectrum. And uh, if we don't recognize that, uh, and why do we need to isolate everybody in the way that often is done in, in care facilities? So there already might be isolation and confinement in quite uh, small areas. And next slide. And now it's gone to, uh, there's even more uh, quarantine, more isolation, uh, signs on the doors to prevent visitors, all with very good reason. Um, I know that one place I was working with could not get any gowns and PPE equipment. So I actually went out to uh, several local Home Depots and bought suits similar to how that looks that contractors and painters normally would be wearing during their work. And I went out and I bought cases of those and shipped them out. And the people at Home Depot were going, why are you buying, um, you know, 60 of these um, gowns and, and suits? So there's a lot of isolation, both from what's necessary for infection control and uh, to keep other people from coming in and, and being affected. So now with the increased isolation, and if you go to the next slide, um, this is building on what many studies already have documented about nursing homes, that the, uh, the loneliness that can be so prevalent uh, at a very profound level for individual residents in nursing homes. They're living surrounded by people, but they, they feel lonely. They feel that they don't have a purpose and uh, they feel that no one really knows them. So uh, this is something that, that NCAP and all of you on this, on this webinar are so creative at trying to break down these feelings and to get past this and to bring meaning to your residents that you're um, interacting with. So next slide. So what can we do to bring meaning in these uncertain times? And first of all, you know, again, I, I'm focusing primarily on your residents that are uh, living with dementia, but we should never discount them. And I love talking to them and I learn so much from them. And one of the first things that I ask is that we go in and, and talk to them about what you're experiencing and about what is going on. And don't assume they can't understand and they can't contribute. So a couple of places have, um, kind of made a, a wonderful um, way to acknowledge the residents is that they got quotes from the residents about what was going on and what their advice was. Because many of them have been in wars or they have been through the polio outbreaks or other flu pandemics. And they had some really wise things to say and they had some really funny things to say. So uh, they were putting quotes up outside. Bob says, masks are a bunch of hooey. And they put that on a quote outside his office, outside his room. Uh, Mary down the hall said, don't forget to wash your hands. And that was her quote outside her room. So it was a way, again, to recognize 
that individual resident and also bring them in and have them uh, contribute to what's going on and increase their knowledge. The other um, creative engagement that I love, and this can be done at any time and it can be ongoing, and it's also a way to get families involved because families are asking, how can we support you? What can we do? What can we bring in? And of course, we're having them send dinner to the homes of the caregivers who are working. We're having them uh, create care baskets to give the staff. We're, we're trying to um, engage the, the families as much as possible and, and show their support, both for their loved ones inside and for the staff. But another thing they can do is we ask them to bring in magazines that have photos in them. And so if you have a resident that um, has cognitive changes and even someone who might not be very verbal, uh, but still will we'll share something, uh, you can begin to create this wonderful book about their life. And I know we have life stories, I know we get this information, but this is really from sitting with that resident and um, you know, they, if they say they had a puppy or they're remembering a puppy that they had when they were growing up, you're looking for a picture of, of a puppy that you're putting in this folder. Uh, if you do use a three ring binder, then you can continue to add pages as you want to. Anyway, it's this wonderful folder that both captures uh, some of their memories, and it also is a great uh, tool for initiating conversation on a very personal, uh, individual basis with the residents. So if any of you have done that, I'd, I'd love to hear about your experiences with that. And it's a visual reminder for that resident about some significant landmarks in their life. The next uh, slide. Um, just and so I, we, we had several people ask a um, question about masks and how we talk about it um, to our residents living with dementia, especially Angela Davis had a question about uh, what are your thoughts on telling um, about either the mask or the fact that there is no family visits? Would you have any advice on that? Yes, um, I do. And um, actually, the next slide talks a little bit about ways we can continue to connect with families. But it is, it's, it's so tough for them to have that, uh, that personal visit cut off from people that are meaning, meaningful relationships for them. Um, I do believe in talking to them. I do believe in uh, the person who's living with dementia to be talking to them, that there is a, uh, some people are ill and we want to protect you. This is why I'm wearing this mask. Um, the, we try to have masks that we also offer to the residents. Some residents will tolerate them, some of them won't. Um, sometimes we can do things like uh, with markers, we can create designs on them together. Uh, we can ask that, I want to keep you safe. I want you to keep me safe. Can you wear this while we talk? Um, but it's, it can be a challenge to have um, any older adult who also just might feel confined wearing a mask, uh, but certainly someone who's living with dementia. But I always believe in talking to them about it. And um, this, this slide here, this was um, this family, we encourage families to make an appointment to come and visit outside the window. And then we, uh, we had made cupcakes and the resident had a cupcake and we took some out to the family and together they could share that. Um, I recognize that some of your buildings are, might be multi-story. You might not be able to have family right outside the window. Uh, those are those are definitely challenges. Thank goodness for things like Zoom and FaceTime and stuff. But it can be very hard to miss that hug. Um, and I think we need to talk about that. How does that feel? You miss your daughter hugging you. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel good. We love you here. We love you here. Um, the other thing is we've encouraged families to send postcards with either their photos on them. You can make postcards now online. 
uh, and print them out and mail them or drop them off at the front door if they can, or postcards that show a picture of where they're living if there's a significant landmark. And we announce it um, at the, at the uh, a certain time during the day. We have a basket, we put all the postcards in it. If, if residents don't have families that can send them postcards, we might create some postcards and put them in there for the, those residents. And we announce it and we go around clapping, uh, carrying the basket saying, you've got mail, you've got mail, Sally's got mail. And then we, um, if Sally can read her postcard, we hand it to her and she reads it. If not, we say, can we read you your postcard? And we read it to her and we say, congratulations, Sally, someone loves you. So um, we're trying to keep that, that connection up in positive ways. Um, definitely a challenge. Uh, next slide. The other thing we have uh, tried to do is get families very involved in personalizing the room. Uh, this is a time where they're spending so much time in their room. So uh, we have actually rearranged the furniture in a lot of the places where I am. We've taken the lounge chairs out of the the TV rooms and the meeting rooms, and we've put them into individual rooms. Um, there are rooms that are bare of furniture and we've, because we've moved them into resident rooms. Uh, we try to have a little table, so we want to encourage them, of course, to be out of bed as much as possible. So we try to be sure they have comfortable seating, that they have a little table, that can we dress that table up for tea time when we bring in tea. We ask families to uh, donate fresh flowers. So we bring in fresh flowers every day if possible. Um, if there are windows and curtains, of course, those are open, so important. Uh, just from a health wise, they're saying if you're able to open a window and have uh, good ventilation can help a lot. So time to personalize that room uh, and make it comfortable. And if possible, so they have a variety of seating areas uh, good for their skin, good for their health. And uh, it's also so important that they're not uh, lying or sitting all day. We have a schedule uh, where we really make a big deal about pampering. So again, this is another thing we've asked families to donate if they can um, bring in any special things that might make it special for that uh, resident in terms of uh, lotions and special shirts and bring in new ties for the gentleman. Uh, so we really make a thing about pampering them and making them look their best. Um, you know, I'm seeing you. Uh, I want to see how beautiful you are today. And we're going to call your daughter later. She wants to see how beautiful you are today. So, so we know that there is um, some psychosocial benefits of uh, people getting up, uh, having good hygiene and um, good dressing. Next slide. So another way to recognize uh, individual residents is we work with the uh, culinary and uh, we have highlighted different residents' uh, favorite food or favorite recipe. So this is a great way to reminisce. Um, Many of the residents take pride in how they served and fed their families. And whether it's the men barbecuing, um, you know, we had one guy who really liked to make bread for his family. Uh, of course, many of the women will have recipes they can share. So we, again, make a big deal about tonight for dinner, we're having Bob's meatloaf. It's printed out um, if, you know, on a poster or at least um, uh, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and the recipe is posted and we talk about it and we look forward to it. It's something it's, we're gonna have that for dinner tonight. Uh, and then uh, a couple of places have started to uh, collect those and they're gonna do a fundraiser and sell a cookbook. So. Um, some, some fun things, and it's another way to recognize that individual resident. Next slide. Um, so there's a lot, whole dialogue going on, and I know that, that NCAP is real involved in this, in giving people purpose. And there's a, there's a whole talk about, this is why 
people, the average age of moving in is 85 years old and they have four chronic diseases before they move in. No one is looking forward to the day they're gonna move into a nursing home or assisted living. Uh, they're waiting till the end. And part of that is people express, I'm not gonna move in there, my life is gonna be over. Um, so as a whole industry, as a whole care industry, can we begin to change that approach and uh, that people see that they're an essential part, that, that they're a part of a team, they have a function, they have a, a role. So uh, Don already mentioned some things that, um, that people can do to um, purpose and involve them. Uh, I love the idea of museums and things. Uh, one of the things that we've done is, uh, especially for the uh, residents who are living with dementia, and some of them are not real physically active or not real verbal anymore, but they still have sensory and tactile um, abilities. And so our kitchen uh, either orders or makes large amounts of bread dough. And we bring it around in the afternoon. Each resident in the afternoon gets a piece of bread dough. And we talk about we're going to have pizza tonight for dinner, or we're, we're making rolls for dinner. And will you help us? And again, hopefully they have a little table and they can massage that, they can knead it, they can slap it around, they can roll it out. If they want to taste it, if they want to smell it, it can be a sensory experience for them. Then, you know, when they are done forming or doing whatever they can do with it, um, it's taken away. And then for dinner, we have pizza or we have bread rolls. It might not be the same dough that they were uh, needing for infection control, but we're, we thank them for their contribution and we bring it out when it's hot. And can you smell? Uh, look what you did. It's wonderful. So it's, um, it's a wonderful tactile sensory experience for people who are living with dementia. When in the times when there's not COVID, I like to have cooking clubs where you're sitting around the table, everyone has their own individual piece of bread. They're rolling it out. Uh, they're getting to taste the sauce. They're putting the sauce, the cheese on. That goes back and gets baked, and uh, they have their own pizza, which is, is really fun. Okay, next next um, slide. And I'm going so fast here, I, I know that, but part of it is I'm anxious to get to um, hopefully questions and other good ideas that all of you can contribute. Um, any of us who've been sick, hopefully not with COVID, but even the flu for two or three days or a bad cold, after two or three days of being immobile, you get up and you feel a little shaky. And um, it's, so mobility is just so key for everything, for, for mood, for health, for bone strength, for um, ability to maintain independence. So I hope that there's a schedule so uh, we know that everyone is getting movement every day. And it could be that every time someone enters someone's room, all they're doing is getting them to change from one surface to another. Okay, uh, you've been in this chair, let me help you, or do you need assistance, and can we go and sit in this other chair or sit on the edge of the bed for a few minutes? Every time you're able to get a person to stand up bear weight, you are doing them such a gift, giving them such a gift and helping them so much. Um, when I work in facilities and it's not COVID and I walk in and I see people in wheelchairs, I always wanna know, why are they in a wheelchair? Is there a doctor's order? Let's look in their chart. Almost never is there an order for people to be in wheelchairs. There might be a few people who truly need them, but often they're put into a wheelchair for whatever, and um, wheelchairs, as we all know, were never meant to be sat in all day. Uh, they were meant for transportation, and they have become, I swear they multiply at night, so they've become so um, common and part of our environments. I always challenge us to get people out of um, wheelchairs. I don't know, some of you do things where I like to post at the end of a hall. I talk about needing a goal for a place to walk or a place to go. And so 
Um, for those in Texas, I, I post Houston at the end of a hall, and we might have some interesting pictures and data about things that are going on in Houston at the end of the other hall is, is Dallas or Fort Worth. Uh, and so, you know, it's a way to motivate people. Let's go to Houston today. And you go down there, and then if you can, do you think, sh should we go to Dallas too? And so it's, it's a way to get a, give them a goal uh, rather than just saying, let's go out and walk down the hall. The next slide. One quick I'm question. sure that. Um, and okay. One, based on your experience, is there a better time of the day for our residents that live with a more advanced degree of cognitive change? A better time of the day well, I'm sorry, for, for, exercise, for exercise and movement. Mm, uh, no, no, I I really uh, do not like to make generalizations because they're going to be as individual as all of we are. Uh, I get up at 7 a.m. every morning and go for about a four or five mile walk every day. And if I don't do it in the morning, I'm probably not going to do it. That's, you know, so I am a morning person, uh, but there may be other people that you cannot entice to even walk out onto the patio or, or, or walk, you know, until it's lunchtime and maybe you can get them to go down to the dining area. So it's, it comes from deep knowing, it comes from knowing every individual. Okay, thank you. And just so you know, and we have uh -huh. about five minutes left. Okay, all righty. Okay, so we can skip this one. I know that you all know Go For Life. I love it. I think it's a very well-structured um, uh, exercise uh, program. Uh, a couple of places we have asked families who can to donate a drum. And we sit out on the hall and have uh, not a drum circle, but we have drums. And Boy, we've had we've been surprised by how some people have been engaged with that of pounding on those drums, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Okay, the next slide um, talks about probably a resident that we all have that is determined to get out. Uh, he needs to leave, uh, quarantining them in their rooms. How tough is that for any of us? Uh, if you're living with cognitive changes or not but uh, a resident who absolutely needs to get out. And uh, even in time of quarantine, uh, there are some times you just have to take these people out. You cannot force them to stay in their rooms. Uh, so you uh, try to bargain with them. I, it is so important. Let's go for a walk. Let's go outside and see some sun. You absolutely are going to have to put this on. I know it looks crazy, doesn't it? It looks crazy on me too. All right, we're going to put this on. Uh, so you, you bargain with them, but you have to get them out sometime. Um, we might say we have a schedule for that at two o'clock. We're going to take Bob for a walk, but he might need to go for a walk at 10 a.m. So we have to be flexible too. The other thing is I really resist using the word behavior because to me that diminishes the meaning behind the action. So if Bob is at his door needing to get out, needing to get out, he's not a behavior problem. He's not an elopement risk. He is an adult who is uh, trying to enact a very normal adult action, which is he wants to leave, so he's gonna open the door and get out. That, th we all do that dozens of times every day. It's, an, it's a normal adult action. So I ask us to also reframe how we're thinking and instead of labeling something as a behavior or a problem, first think this is a normal adult action. What is he trying to communicate to us? Okay, next. Uh, and I can talk, if there's time at the end, I can talk about a couple examples of other things in, uh, to do. but. Um, we have about two minutes left. About three or four slides. All righty. We need to know that people um, in this stressful time are able to relax. Um, and I'm a great proponent. If you don't have one, see if you can get your uh, administrator to uh, invest in a blanket warmer. Oh, that goes so far into helping people feel relaxed. 
On the other hand, also sometimes it's a cool cloth on a hot day. Um, the next slide uh, is uh, highlights breathing activities. And I think people often overlook because someone is living with dementia, they don't do mindful breathing. And there's so many studies of how that uh, decreases stress and anxiety and better sleep and things like this. Don't think because someone is living with dementia, they can't benefit from that. Um, sleep is probably more than ordinarily interrupted right now. We don't want to resort to a lot of sleeping tablets. Uh, so is your night staff prepared to play games, to read, to give a hand massage? Are they prepared to do these things rather than saying, um, we need some uh, Ativan here to help this woman sleep through the night? The next slide, uh, if you're not using lavender oil, I encourage you, uh, one of the uh, things that is valid that can help with sleep. Just a couple drops on a pillowcase. Don't put it on their skin. Don't don't make it too intense. A couple drops on their pillowcase of essential oils. All right, the next slide is um, we know about the stigma associated with dementia. People um, try and cover it up. They're, they're, we immediately assume people are unable because they have dementia. These are my guidelines for uh, meaningful engagement. I always try and create the least restrictive environment possible. I try to uh, create normalcy. Um, I don't assume because they um, have dementia that they cannot or will not be interested in something. Um, break down that isolation. I want to be sure that everything is enhancing the image, that it's not detracting, making them look, of course, childlike, anything like that. I always want to talk about their strengths and talents and uh, recognize the individual preferences. Just a, a couple words on the strengths and talents. I've actually had, when I visit places, I, people, I ask them to introduce me to residents, and they often will say, this was Mary. She used to be a great teacher. Now she can't even really read. And in my mind, it blows my mind. I'm going, why would you introduce someone by what they can no longer do? Why don't you tell me that Mary is a great teacher and now, boy, she brings life when there is music here. She starts clapping. She is our best, you know, music person. Why don't you tell me something that Mary can still do? So I encourage all of us as professionals to focus on the strengths and talents when people are living with dementia. All right, that was a rush. I'll stop there. <laughs> we're, we're doing great things um, and continuing to learn. This is an amazing time. Thank you very much, Anne. I, um, I welcome anyone to send Anne questions. Here are her details. And thank you so much for performing such a difficult task, which is to talk about meaning <laughs> and for people living with dementia, but it's true that these are incredible times. And I hope that mm -hmm. every one of you understand how essential they are, always, and in these special times, essential to help uh, the residents live with meaning and purpose. So with that, yeah. both Dawn and Anne, and Anne, thank you very much for being with us today. I have one last announcement, which is that, as some of you might have seen, Link Senior launched an initiative called Activities Strong, I think two weeks ago. And the goal is to support, to educate, and to empower um, activity and life enrichment professionals in senior living. We also launched a Facebook group to which we'd like to invite you. And the announcement that I wanted to share with all of you today is that we decided to also host a full day event, obviously virtual, the situation, but a full day event on June 23rd. So to get to that, 
And to provide you with that information, we actually launched a website, which is activitiesstrong.com, where you will be able to see the manifesto of the initiative, and you will be able to get the details of that virtual summit. We're doing this in part day with NCAP, where we will be providing up to six CEUs, so a whole day of programming for NCCDP and NCAP. And we already have uh, fantastic speakers confirmed that include Ashton Applewhite, Anne Bastings from Timeslip, Penny Co from Pioneer Network, Kristen, Kirsten Jacobs from Leading Age, and Don Worsley from NCAP. With that, I want to thank you again, Don and Anne, thank you so much for this invaluable presentation. And Megan, I'll leave it up to you for a couple words of administrative. Thanks, Charles. And if you want to go back to the presentation, I think we have a slide for upcoming webinars that we could share with the group. I did want to let everyone know that I have posted the survey link in the chat box in the webinar room. As I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I will be sending that survey link in an email uh, within the hour to everyone who attended this afternoon. And that email will include a link to register for the Activity Strong Virtual Summit. And it will also have a PDF copy of today's slide deck uh, with the slides from both Ann and John. Uh, and you can see on the screen now, we have the upcoming Link Senior webinars. Our next webinar will be May 12th. You'll find a registration link in this afternoon's email for that as well. And Charles, you can go ahead and end the broadcast for today, but we're going to leave the webinar room open so that people can continue to see the survey link and fill that out. Thank you so much. Thanks, Megan. And before I forget everybody on the line, um, you can also register today for the virtual summit. On, my, on the page here, I'm actually sharing from the website. You can directly register for June 23rd. Again, thank you. And uh, I'm just going to end the broadcast and you can stay on uh, if you if we want. Actually, Megan, you're the host, I think, so I can't end the broadcast.